Today we'll start with Jack Cummings. Um, he's a he's been a Linux uh, user for about 20 years. Yeah, using Nixos for the last two three. Um, he works at Intel on solid state drives, SOCs uh, team. So I think this is going to be a very interesting uh, presentation. So let's start. Different, at least. Um. All right, um, like uh, Rock said, my name is Jack. I work in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Um, that's the view from our lab, actually. Um, so um, that's not the view from my cubicle, I wish. But um, So what we do in our office, we do a lot of things, but I'm part of the team that designs the uh, SSD controller ASICs. Um, and if you don't know what SOCs are, it stands for a system on a chip. Uh, part of MERS laws are going forward as we integrate more and more into a chip, and previously where it'd take, whatever, 10 chips to run a computer, and now it takes one. Um, so the controller ASIC for these things um, is getting bigger and bigger and having more and more stuff put on it. But I spent a lot of my time at work um, figuring out how to be more productive, how to make the people I work with be more productive, how to make the computers that we have be more productive, and just be able to do more. So uh, this is an SOC I worked on. Um, it, uh, it had the project name Sage Peak. Someone was mentioning earlier that uh, they use birds for project names. Um, that's what uh, ARM does, actually. But um, we use places. They're kind of, uh, there's no meaning associated with them, so it kind of provides a convenient thing to talk about that no one can figure out what we're talking. But this is, um, this ASIC went into a product called Fultondale, which um, is uh, an NVMe Express SSD. Um, NVMe Express is in itself kind of a fascinating technology that we worked with actually the Linux kernel developers um, in d developing a lower latency I.O. stack. Um, so there's actually a whole bunch of these things on, on, on the market right now. So Samsung has a few, we have a few, um, there's some more, more people generating them. Um, if you want to talk more about why this is really nifty over, over SATA or SAS or other kinds of technologies, that uh, the right person to talk to. Um, so back to what a system on chip is. Um, there are integrated circuits, as you can see there. Everything is in that one little package there, and actually in this case a single die. Um, it integrates all the components of a, a, syst of a, a regular computer onto a single chip. So this includes all of the IOs, which are input-output Basically, the electrical things that turn digital signals into these analog signals. <sighs> SOCs are everywhere. Um, they're in phones. They're you know in uh, like the Internet of Things. It's all based on SOCs. Computers now. Um, so uh, it's it's kind of a big business, right? There's billions of these things made every year. All right, what are SOCs assembled from? Well, it turns out lots of things. Um, the part that we do most of is uh, digital logic. Um, and digital logic is still analog electrics, it's just that uh, we do some statistical proofs and characterizations and analysis to make sure that things behave digitally, that you know it's either on or off. Uh, we also don't actually do on the, I guess that'd be, you're right, is uh, a, um, the, what we call a register transfer level uh, code for what is the diagram there, which is actually an inverter. Um, so you can't really see it from the slide here, but there's a pin called in on the left and a pin called out on the right. And that is actually what it looks like in silicon. Um, that's cribbed from a magic um, uh, schematic. And so the, the code there is actually what infers that. Um, and you can tell there's a fair bit of boilerplate logic here. The, the logic in the input and output are actually the wires. And the always com says that whenever the input changes, the output should change too. And it should be the opposite of the input. Uh, that's kind of uh, the definition of a trivial example. But um, there, this is a single gate. And some of the designs we work on go into the order of 50 million gates. So what happens is when you stitch all this stuff together and you stitch these things together into something called a netlist, it's actually just a humongous graph 
where your, your, your nodes are uh, logic gates and your elements, or probably your edges, are actually wires. So we use Verilog and System Verilog. Um, they're both terrible organically grown languages. Um, they they kind of remind me a bit of C++. You know, it's not a nice pure design language. It's something that's kind of evolved over time and grown all kinds of warts. Um, so we also don't do the actual place and route as, uh, at our office. So we do um, generate a netlist that contains all the standard cells, which are the AND gates and OR gates and flip-flops and everything else, and hand that off to another team. And I'll get a bit into why that's important later. But um, that in it itself is a, a huge job. All right, just a bit of talking about uh, who, um, the problem that I solved and the solution I came up with using Nix and some of what made it better than what we had before. So our, one of the problems in hardware design is the cost of um, screwing up is really high. So we tend to spend a lot of time making sure we got it right the first time. Um, because the cost of uh, once we ship something off to the fab or the foundry or um, to actually be manufactured into a real thing. And that's kind of what's neat about this is you write code that turns into something you can see. Well, with a big enough microscope. But, but um, once you do that, it's, uh, that takes months for them to get through all the wafer processing stuff. And uh, yeah, it's very expensive. So if you have a, a bug, like, you know, back here, if I forgot that little tilde in front of in, right, that's no longer an inverter, that's an AND gate. Or pardon me, it's a buffer. Um, so that wouldn't work. Then, you, you know, that could be a seriously critical bug. So anyways, the, we're fairly rigorous about our, our design flow. So we start from requirements uh, and look at these requirements, figure out how we're going to uh, meet those requirements, and that's called uh, architecture. We write a specification to meet the requirements. And then we do something that's incredibly valuable, and this is actually the, the reason why things work, is we hand the same specification off to two people. We hand it off to a designer who actually writes the code, and we hand it off to a verification engineer who will then write a verification in, uh, in environment for it, a model, as it were. Um, and then when they get to various checkpoints along the way, or whenever they feel comfortable, they start comparing the two and make sure that they both agreed on what the specification was and that the design meets the specification. Um, it turns out that that is a huge part of what we do. It's incredibly labor intensive um, and it's, you know, it's very difficult to converge on. And I'm sure that everyone knows testing is hard um, and it's really hard to test everything, but we kind of have to, we have a me special methodology we've developed that um, at least knows us when, when let, lets us know what we've done and when we're done. So once we've done the verification, we have the RTL, and the RTL is actually the code that we can synthesize into, into place gates and hand off to be uh, implemented. Um, and so the actual synthesis is a bit like compiling code, except that you add additional constraints about, you know, it, it must run at this frequency, it must be in, fit inside this area, and it must use these certain standard cells. And then we make sure, because we don't trust our tools, because they're actually quite crap, um, they, uh, we have another tool that we run to make sure that what the first tool did was right. Um, and then we generate this netlist, which we hand off to the layout team. And they do their layout and then hand us back uh, placed gates. And then we run that tool again on it to make sure they didn't wreck the thing when they're uh, doing layout. So we get this, working for Intel has certain advantages. We get some, uh, what they call super skews of a processor. So it'll take a high on Xeon processor, cut out um, half of the cores that are too slow, disable hyper-threading, and crank the clock frequency on the others because they're all specially spring skill silicon. So these are uh, Ivy Bridge EP um, uh, compute servers that are running at four and, four and a half gigahertz. They're really good at single-threaded performance stuff. They're, they probably have less throughput than uh, the newer Broadwell EP stuff, but you know, when none of our CAD tools vendors understand how to do threading properly, so it's still all single-threaded performance. And interesting enough, because our CAD tool vendors don't like changing operating systems much, that, um, yeah, we have to run with these archaic kernels. Like, I think, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm not kidding, that, that thing is, what, six years old now? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, 
I have no idea. Like, it's been patched, I don't know, it's either 7,000 times or 700,000 times. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just, so this actually causes unique problems in, with Nixos stuff because glibc 2.19 is the last glibc that supports kernels that old. So I, had, I have to have a special version of Nix packages that uses an older glibc. So this is the way we used to do things. We typically use make in isolation uh, for various tasks. Um, and since some of our tasks have multiple output files, we use touch files. We have a bunch of shell scripts written by engineers, and engineers aren't really good at writing code. Um, the, and then we have these Perl scripts that part the, parse the output of make debug, which is fragile and kind of horrific. Um, and there's more confusion. And so to get around all this, we have checklists that we follow to make sure that everything was done right, um, which usually means you have to go back and try and figure out why your make scripts failed. Um, and more confusion. And yeah, so it's usually, of course, by the time everything's coming together right before you meet your deadlines is when there's the most stress and then finding that, oh dear, we forgot to compile that in or you know somehow we got the wrong version of something else can lead to tragedy. All right, this is uh, an example. This is a bit, um, I'll come back to this, what this is doing. Um, and there is a bug in here, actually. I just discovered when I was going through this, the slides this morning. Um, and if someone had, pointed out, and when I come back to the slide, I'll, I'll be very interested. But um, this is verification. Um, and it has all kinds of nice things in it that, that Nix does. There's a, a map reduce. Um, so you can see here on line 22, the regression is actually mapping uh, the attribute up top there against uh, building uh, a function to build simulations, and then reducing all of the outputs of the simulations into a coverage database. Um, and this is something that it's neat to see that it, it's just, well, okay, maybe it's not just there, but uh, it's, these kind of things are built into Nix, and it's really easy to just be able to use them. Doing a map reduce and make is a lot more work. Um, that's kind of hard to tell what you're doing. So I'm going to talk a bit more about the design partitioning and the design process we do, because it is kind of important. And the reason I'm going to talk about it is you, when you start looking at the design flow, you can kind of, kind of also almost start picking derivations out of the design flow. It's like, well, you know, the doing an elaboration is just a derivation. Anyways, uh, there's, in the process of um, the design flow, there's kind of a duel of partitioning and, and, and the actual tasks. So the part, point of partitioning is we want to give individual engineers a block that they completely understand um, so that they can take ownership of it. And this is kind of an important thing for engineering is engineers work better when they take ownership of things. Uh, when you have four owners for something, it's people don't have the same quality of code they put into you. Then if you know, they own this block, it is theirs. If there's a bug in it, then that's their responsibility to fix it. But the problem is our designs are too big to give ownership of everything to one person. So we have a hierarchical process where we recursively partition things down till, till we get to... Uh, blocks that individual engineers can deal with. Um, it's important because it, it bind, uh, bounds the complexity of design and it bounds the complexity of verification. So it, they're, a hand-waving mathematical proof is like the, this, the possible state inside one of these blocks is two to the power of the state vector inside. So if you, uh, but when you're doing verification, you can, we do black box verification, so you can only actually really stimulate the outside of the block, right? So it's kind of a perimeter versus area thing. So the, the bigger the area of your block is, the harder it is to reach all of the state inside. So if you have too much, if your block is too big, it starts beginning very difficult to actually exercise all the state inside. So um, back to the design tasks. Um, so we, this is the, we, we uh, apply recursively to the blocks. So the interesting thing here is requirements uh, pardon me, a specification for a higher level block becomes a requirements for a low level block. So you can do this recursively forever um, until you get down to the size, I guess is your fixed point is you uh, reach something a person can, uh, a single person can deal with. And then when you roll this back up, you have different levels of hierarchy, um, subsystems and then a chip level. So I was the chip level lead for the last chip I was working on this. So I don't understand how the individual details of all the blocks work, but 
I know they meet their specifications, I know where their specifications are, and I know they've been verified, so I don't need to know. Um, we don't do code reviews, surprisingly, because we verify that it meets their specification. I actually don't really care what's in the blocks, as long as they synthesize it. Yeah. All right. This is, we've gone through this same chart a few times. So this is about implemented index. We could actually play, implement the, the architecture and layout stages too, and the hooks are there, but the architecture is actually kind of fuzzy, the process for doing that, and layout isn't some, is something we have a third party do. So uh, the design verification implementation and formal equivalence checks um, are all done with Nix on the, on the project I did. Um, and this is actually uh, <laughs> the uh, entire tasks of what I did. It's a bit of an eye chart. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in a bit. You can actually see the, the derivations. Oh, come on, events. So uh, you can see the verification task here. You can see all the different, all the different derivations that get used as we grind through here. So, and you'll see, notice, you'll recognize some of these from the up above. I was showing. So, why Nix works for us? Um, it's nice and nice and pure. It does lazy evaluation, which is important because some of these derivations can be incredibly expensive. Um, it does fine grained dependencies, which is actually uh, really helps with only building what you need to. Um, the I, after one of the presentations yesterday, I changed the good documentation to good reference documentation um, because, because the language specification is actually really nice. The, 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 all, of the, all of the built-ins are, are well described. Um, how everything works is really nice. Uh, the assertions in Nix are actually awesome. I love them. Um, and that, that's important when you have a lot of different types of, of uh, derivations. So, All right. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about design tasks because it kind of gives an idea of what things are like at the bottom. So this is what a directory structure would look like. We have these .v files and the .svh files, um, which are .v files are actually Verilog files. It's an extension of Verilog. Verilog looks a lot like C um, with teeth. Um, so this directory structure is important because we use Mercurial, um, or we could use Git, it doesn't really matter, um, for our blocks. Each block lives in its own branch. And then when a designer decides that they're at a particular good, good point to release something, they tag it. And then when we integrate stuff, we just merge in tags. So that works nicely because all the stuff for this meh block um, is in its own directory structure. And when we merge it with some other block, then there's no conflicts. Um, so, and also the way this works is at the higher, like a subsystem level, I can actually, I just import that meh.nix file, um, which contains all the information about all this RTL files. So what's going on here is, uh, I use a probably lesser known uh, feature in Nix. Um, it mostly gets used in Nix packages for patch files that are loaded in the, uh, um, in the Nix package itself, or version control and the Nix packages repository itself. Is if you reference a bare file in Nix, it just copies that file into, into the store and then gives you uh, the variable uh, then becomes the path to what it copied to in the store. And this turns out to be really helpful because um, when you're iterating on stuff, as soon as you do a Nix build, um, it's copied everything into the store and you can go back to editing your workspace and you don't need to worry about uh, interfe interfering with the build that's currently working. So this is what uh, one of those mat.nix files looks like. Um, the only real complicated thing here is this compile units, um, which kind of begins to look like we're, I'm using nix like make here. Um, this is a simple compile unit. It is a list of attribute sets. Um, and the reason for this is it's a Verilog LRM thing. It deals with the scope of which the compiler will pay attention to includes. Um, and because includes are a terrible source of impurity, um, we, I, I try to very carefully bound that. And to the point where um, if you want to uh, pound include a file, um, you actually have to specify it here in the includes what the file you want, the list of files you want to include are, so that you don't, including something out of some random spot in the environment that's not tracked by Nix 
when it's building stuff. So that it, if you change something in that include file, that your hashes will change and Nix knows it needs to rebuild everything. So there are a couple useful uh, attributes in this um, net.nix file. Um, the lib attribute and the lab attribute. The lib attribute is basically compiles everything into a library, which is a big binary file that's specific to the simulator. Um, and that is what we will use at a higher level. So we just include, like we just start using the .lib file from all of these little blocks, and then we don't need to recompile things. And, excuse me, the elaboration is, I suppose the analogy is, is linking a binary to make sure that all of your, your symbols are resolved. And in the case here, this makes sure that all your ports match up and that everything kind of fits where it's supposed to. They're relatively cheap things to do, uh, and they catch a lot of problems. So when we want to use this MEH block, um, higher level, uh, this is something that instantiates the MEH block. Um, it has compile units too, because it needs to instantiate it somewhere. Um, and it has a lib too, because it has code. But um, the interesting thing about it is during the elaboration, you notice that the libraries now has pulls the meh.lib attribute out of here. So what that does then is when it does the elaboration, it says, okay, pull this elaboration library out of the store. All right, um, and then I've got a bunch of regular stuff, um, regular IP that's kind of derpy um, that we get from third parties. Uh, and there's just use standard derivations for putting that stuff in spots. And of course, since everyone packages their IP differently, if you want to put the models or the specifications in a whole spot, you have to have different derivations for all of them. All right, uh, verification flow. This one's I talked a bit about before, but basically what it comes down to is this is pr probably the core of what makes us do SOCs without many revisions. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it because I don't really have a lot of time, but um, basically we extract requirements from, from specifications. We map those, what we call design requirements, into verification requirements, which are based the things we want to see and the one things we want to check. Uh, we map, map those verification requirements into, into tests, and we run, the, run those tests. Um, this really only describes part of what we do because this is all just directed tests, which is probably more of what's understood in the software world. But uh, the majority of our coverage of things, uh, functional coverage, is comes from random constraint simulations. So uh, when I talk about coverage, I'm not talking about code coverage. I'm talking about functional coverage. And functional coverage means that we gave the design the stimulus you want. It did the right thing when we gave that stimulus, and uh, we saw it. Um, so. This is important because what you really care about is the thing did what you wanted it to. Um, oh, as a quick question, does anyone know the difference between verification and validation? Anyone? All right. Uh, okay. Verification is a design meets a specification. Validation is a design is suitable for a purpose. And they're not quite the same thing because not we don't always get the specifications right, which is kind of outside of what we do. But so. Uh, that comes us, brings us back to this. So, did anyone figure out where the bug was? It's, a, it's an off by one. This is supposed to be a one. Testing. Pardon me? I said the Oh, okay. So uh, what we're doing here is we have five, or five different tests there, and they run a whole bunch of seeds for it because they have uh, um, random components. Um, and our simulations have uh, random stability, meaning that as so long as the design doesn't change, the same seed will generate the same stimulus. Uh, that's kind of important for debugging, is when something crashes, you want to be able to figure out why it crashed. Um, but also you notice that there's a bunch of skips in there. That's because you may notice that when you're designing something or testing something, often your, test, your bugs are actually in your tests, not in your design or your code. 
So this is just acknowledging the fact that you know often when you start really testing things, especially random tests, you kind of cross all kinds of things you never expected you'd come across, like uh, address collisions and all kinds of stuff. So um, the reason this is a, the, uh, supposed to be a one is because when you do a, a range from zero to 200, you're actually that's 201 elements, not 200 elements. So um, uh, yeah. So what this does is pulls runs runs all the simulations. So this regression attribute here is a big list or a list of lists of all of the simulation elements which are generated with this build regression sim uh, function. And then we merge everything into uh, with this coverage thing here. Uh, and what this does is when we there's stuff built into our language that says when you see something, say that you saw it, and it keeps a database of what it saw. And then we merge across all the simulations that we run to see what we saw everywhere and that worked. And then if we say we saw everything we wanted to say, see, we're done, and it worked. So this also means if you know we didn't see for this SSD, we didn't see a read followed by a write ever that worked, then that's a pretty good place to look to say, oh, there might be a bug there. Because we probably generated the stimulus for a read followed by a write, but we never saw one working. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a fascinating look at, way of looking at things. Um, all right, um, talk a bit about one of the simple derivations. This is, uh, they're all basically, uh, based on the standard environment, make derivation stuff. Um, I had to, I was saying how the assertions are pretty awesome. Um, you can actually read those assertions. They actually kind of make sense what they're doing. Um, it's like the built-ins is list, sure. Um, make sure that uh, the a laptop is a valid module name. If you, for instance, if you have a space and a module name, it's not a legal Verilog module name. Um, the next two are kind of important for the way the tool flow works is you could, since the uh, libraries is a list, you could give it a list of strings and those are, if you tried to feed those into the simulator, it would just, yeah, it's, it's going to crash. But um, the assertion here goes through and checks this CAD type thing and all of the derivations to make sure that it matches. Um, and the next assertion is if you have two libraries, <laughs> discover this one a while in, is you have two libraries with the same name, it doesn't pay attention to the first one, which you might, it's probably an error in one of your derivations somewhere else, but it's kind of annoying that you lost half your design somehow. So the reason for doing these derivations is there are, uh, there's an ecosystem of CAD tools, and there are certain points which we divide things on that, uh, uh, like the compile units, for instance, there are logical partitioning where you can swap out tools. So the idea being is this is using a tool called ModelSim for doing elaboration, but there are many other tools to do elaboration, many different simulators. For instance, there's the open source Icarus Verilog simulator and a few other ones. So the, the idea being is if you go back to the meh.nix um, file, it just calls make a lab. It doesn't care which simulator you're using. So you could swap out in the back end here, you could swap out to use Icarus now, or you could swap out to use VCS or NCSIM or whatever other simulator you want. And it takes the same arguments, it takes the same compile units, um, it just does something different under the hood, generates a different derivation. <sighs> to talk about something, <laughs> the reason I put this in here, because this is using another n nifty thing I, I discovered in uh, uh, MNIX. Um, we do these things called ECOs, which stands for engineering change order. Once, so what happens is once we ship off this netlist, uh, hand off the layout, we actually can't resynthesize anymore. Like once it's, we've handed that one off, it takes like 12 weeks for them to finish their doing all the layout. But if we find a bug that we need to fix in the netlist, we can't just resynthesize it. So what we have to do is we have to write a script that disconnects wires, rewires, um, standard cells, you know, instantiates new standard cells, and the netlist itself. And this is kind of complicated because we don't simulate the actual netlist because it's not worth doing, because it's incredibly painful to simulate gates. Just don't do it. Um, there's no value in it because it, it, uh, you don't actually get any knowledge and just spend a lot of effort doing it. So we simulate the, the actual RTL code. So what we end up doing here is, is let's say we have this netlist handoff that we originally did, 
And it turns out that we shipped it, and then the verification team in their last um, simulations discovers a bug. Um, so what we have to do is you have to go write an ECO against the RTL, so just fix the code, and verify that they fixed it. Um, and so that gives us a, okay, verification's good, you fixed the bug. And then we have to uh, patch the netlist, and then the patch the place gates. Um, and then the, the problem with that is then we need to make sure that those fixes were equivalent. Is So um, that is actually what we use those form equivalence tools for. So this part of the flow isn't as labor intensive as the verification flow because uh, once you go into a more rigid formalism, you can use more powerful tools. Like the the um, the placed gates and netlists are quite rigid formalisms that you know you're just all now in the realm of Boolean logic. There isn't really any room for interpretation. So this is what the ECO scripts look like, um, and it, the reason I brought this up is. You you always end up doing more than one. In this particular design, there are 34, um, and that's across the en entire chip. So uh, what it is, is you also have to apply them sequentially, and this is just a fold left. So you talk to, take the original net list and apply ECO sequentially, and you know it all goes into that fold left. Um, and this actually is another place where Nix is really helpful, because... Um, it's expensive to do these because you have to load the whole design in, and each one of these scripts takes like five minutes to do, to run. So um, you can see there's 34 of them. So 34 times five is a long time to actually generate all this stuff to make sure that it works. So uh, what I typically do after doing this is after I, you know I generate the last ECO there and I push that into a binary cache which is accessible via NFS, so that if someone has the unfortunate uh, needs to add another ECO, then what happens is Nix will just pull the intermediate generated netlists out of the binary cache, which saves immense amounts of time. We also, um, there's this ticket thing in here because part of when we find a bug, we have to file a ticket. So we have a nice place to put all the discussion of what the bug is and uh, what happened with it. Um, so we actually uh, start putting uh, th this apply AC or this apply AC actually puts in comments in the netlist exactly which bugs are fixed in it. Just kind of a handy tracking thing. Uh, now on to the tools. The tools are um, the CAD tools are the worst software I've ever used. Um, they, yeah, it's I don't know. It, considering we pay an immense amount of money for them, they're they're just horrible. Um, so uh, the uh, as you can see, um, what a, what a part of what I do is I actually uh, have something that looks like Nix packages, but it imports Nix packages that I load the tools in out of their, their tarballs, um, patch off them all to use Nix, um, and uh, execute them from inside the Nix store, just like regular Nix packages. However, um, I came across things like uh, no one actually uses libtermcap anymore. Um, and because, I don't, know, I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, NCURS has replaced it, and it's actually ABI compatible. So... Um, you can actually, before Patch Elf grew the ability to change the R, the DT needed in a, in a Elf file, um, I was actually using sed to change the DT needed in a, yeah. And I, I don't know, it's kind of satisfying to do great violence upon the tools because, yeah. In the future, uh, I'm very keen on the FHS shrewd environment because that means I wouldn't need to do this anymore. I can just create a Red Hat or CentOS uh, FHS shrewd environment, throw the CAD tool in there and run it from there. Um, unfortunately, I can't really do that in the environment I have right now because I don't have root access, so I can't use shrewd. So, eh. All right. Um, I mentioned this a bit earlier, but we have a lot of external IP. We don't do everything ourselves. And one of the problems is that when you have... 400 pieces of external IP, and you want to actually compile them all. No one gives you things in the same format. You can't ask them to give them all the, with the files in the same spot. So Nix is really good at being able to manage all of this because you just have different derivations for all of them. You can manage them independently. You can give them the version numbers that you can pull out of um, the you know build time dependencies. So you can figure out exactly what went into a particular derivation. Um, so that it, it makes the job that I had to do as a librarian a bit easier. 
um, because otherwise it just gets untenable pretty quickly. Normally, we'd have to have one or two people doing this, and so I did this, uh, the Iperior librarian, as well as actually writing Next and doing all the chip level integration. The other interest, the other module in the Next CAD stuff that I wrote is uh, this project module, which um, is kind of a meta layer on top of all of the, cat, the derivations you saw before, which basically says what set of derivations you use, which CAD tools to use, and what versions of the CAD tools to use, because I think I went through about 40 different versions of various CAD tools throughout the project because they're so buggy. Um, which standard cells to use because the, you know, they're, when you think of AND gates, OR gates, and NOR gates, and exclusive OR gates, you think there's, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them. The, it's, I think we had about 6,000 standard cells because there's different drive strengths, there's different um, threshold voltages, there's different sizes. Um, the technology that you're implementing to, so the metal stack, the silicon process, um, that's all important when you're doing synthesis. Um, and operating conditions. Silicon, I'm not sure if everyone's done any overclocking stuff, but there's a reason you uh, cool things down to like negative 40 or uh, liquid nitrogen cool processors to make them go faster is because silicon is faster, cold. It gets really slow when it gets hot, and the difference in speed is like a factor of three or so. So things that work in the fast corner don't work in the slow corner, and things that work in the slow corner don't work in the fast corner. So you have to kind of meet timing across all these, and it's actually a fairly challenging task. So I wrote a metrics module. Um, this is uh, area of a block. Um, so it's I have a bunch of uh, hacky Perl scripts um, that look at reports generated by various CAD tools and write the JSON to feed into Influx database, um, which the people at Influx database then promptly stopped using JSON. Um, so they decided their JSON parser was using was slowing them down, so they went to a different format, which is, means I have to rewrite all my scripts. Um, I use Grafana to generate graphs. Um, I think it was uh, Yaka. It was yesterday I was talking about using Grafana in the Flux database, so I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, use Morgoth for anomaly detection. Um, so there's a couple anomalies in that graph that are kind of interesting. Um, so Hydra, during its constant evaluation, evaluates blocks and extracts metrics from it doing these blocks. So you can look at, I don't have to individually look at the output of all these things, I can just look at a dashboard. Um, so when someone screws up one of their blocks and it synthesizes down to nothing because our, our synthesis tools are at least smart enough to know that <clears throat> if you tie the reset for a block off to zero, it can never come out of reset so they don't bother implementing anything in there. Um, so this chart is interesting because what it is is we synthesize both, both at the block level and the chip level. And what's interesting to see is when we synthesize something at the block level, how much area it uses, how many gates it has versus when you put it in the chip level and put it with all those other blocks, how much area it has. So the anomalies here are actually because, um, are at the chip level, because what had happened is in one of the register buses to read and write registers from in, in the design to control what it does, um, there was a bug that made it so that it could never actually read or write registers. So all those registers got blown away. So you can see that it, it, the block got like half, half the size it was supposed to be. Um, which means that something's badly broken. And I have a special module for controlling when we have to make a handoff to someone. So we build board support packages, we build netlist deliverables, we do ECO deliveries so that we have a bundle of ECOs that we hand off to the, the people doing the layout so that they can you know, see here are the scripts that you need to run on the, on the placed gates to make sure it works. Um, and for, for the board support packages, here are all the register header files, all, this, all 300 specifications you need about all the IP. Um, so those all things you want to kind of abstract a bit because uh, everyone wants them a little differently. Um, we use Hydra a lot. Um, so I had as an uh, idea of basically the scope of what we're doing here. There are uh, about 20 blocks, four subsystems, um, a top level, um, and the board support packages. So each, of each of the low-level blocks, there are 24 derivations that get evaluated from just doing an elaboration and simulator, um, an elaboration and synthesis tool doing a synthesis, to doing checking of all the little power collateral to making sure it meets timing, to linting, to all kinds of stuff. Um, 
the, the subsystems have less because some of the subsystems are more difficult to synthesize by themselves. And the chip level has more because there are more checks that we need to do at the top to make sure it all works. So, um, yeah, that doesn't look very pretty, actually. It's kind of a, there's a lot of orange, red, and brown on there. Uh, <laughs> things are in a constant state of not working. Um, but that's okay, because if everything worked all the time, that means you should have shipped a while ago. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm in the process of open sourcing all of this stuff, I actually have approval from the uh, from Intel to do this, um, which was a presentation that I had to make to the. I'm not sure if you guys know, but Intel, I think this year became the single largest contributor to Linux curl, um, and so we have a lot of people that work on Linux inside Intel, which is great. They they turn out to be the most knowledgeable people I know about how computers work. Um, I think it comes from having to not have good specifications, how everything works, and figure it out yourself. Um, so I, I have approval to do this, but the problem is, is I have to meet a bunch of legal requirements saying that I'm not using uh, commercial code or um, what is this? Yeah, or code that I'm not supposed to be that is a, an incompatible license site. So um, Nix packages is released under an MIT license. I will use Nix cat under an MIT license because it it is a runtime user of Nix packages, and it just kind of the suggestion from the the open source team was to use uh, equivalent license to what the community is using. Um, one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I, I don't honestly expect anyone else to pick this up immediately, but I've noticed that the code I commit to Nix passages gets packages gets better. Like uh, the ZFS module I contributed, I don't know, three or four years ago, has subsequently been evolved into something better. Um, because people use it and find ways to improve it, and that's um, stark contrast to code I commit to internal repositories, which is like rots until it breaks, and then people get really angry at me instead of just fixing it. Um, the, there's a couple of things in here that if someone else does use this and find a different way to do it, it makes everyone's life better, and that's actually something Intel does a lot, which is why Intel develops Linux, is even though developing Linux helps our Intel's competitors. Um, it also makes Intel stuff better, and it makes the entire ecosystem better. So, um, it's a another thing is we demonstrate we're doing interesting things, and that's important for uh, our site locally because we need good people, um, and good people are interested in doing interesting things. So, demonstration that we're doing interesting things means that you know maybe we'll get good applicants. On that note, if anyone. We'll be hiring next year, so if anyone's. Um, and I kind of like it to, it's kind of a bit of a special snowflake infrastructure right now, and I kind of want to grow beyond that a bit. Um, so the other thing I need to do is finish open sourcing the XCAD. I, would, I was planning on doing being done by this, but I had a tape out in the way, so I had a lot of work to do. I didn't have a ton, a ton of time to, special, to analyze this. But the big reason was is I have to take like 10 hours of training to be able to use this course, code scanning tool, and the training is only offered every two weeks. Um, I want more purity. Right now, there is lots of opportunity for uh, impure thing, impurities to come in because uh, I'm not even shooting stuff, so you could just be using random files off of people's home directories. Uh, I would like to, there's actually a, a fairly vibrant community on GitHub for doing open source hardware projects. i probably port a few of those to using GitHub. Um, the, I put a hierarchical constraints in there. I'm not going to explain what that is. Uh, take too long. Um, and the next thing I, I would love to be able to do is using the update operator to take an environment and update all the derivations in it to based on whatever tools you're using. So you can stitch together whatever tool chain you want to be able to use. Um, so the, for instance, environment, the first case is the, the environment that we're kind of using, which is a model sim, which is a simulator, design compiler, which is a synthesis tool, and formality, which is a formal equivalence checking tool. And you know, if you don't have that, yep. I have one side left, I think. So, and it'd be nice to be able to use open source tools. So, uh, any questions? Um, thank you. That was great. Um, how easy is it? been to convince your colleagues to use this and get them up to speed on it? And are you the only person on your team using it, or is there a whole team? 
so there, there's a couple of interesting things there. And uh, this summer, uh, one nice thing about working for Intel is every seven years you get an eight week sabbatical. So I got my sabbatical this summer. So I went on vacation for eight weeks and came back, and people were still using it. So um, it's. <laughs> um, it, it turns out that because I could do a lot more of this stuff and maintain a lot more of this stuff, that with the same amount of effort of maintaining one set of scripts that broke all the time for doing one of these steps, I can maintain this in Nix doing like 30 different steps with about the same amount of effort, uh, which means that people actually want to use it now because they don't have to do it themselves. So it's, uh, it, it's a big productivity improvement for me to be able to sit on top of doing all this. Any more questions? Is there a technical reason for using this uh, old kernel? For using which? This old kernel. Oh, <laughs> it's it, it's a somewhat unfortunate. So the the CAD tool, the EDA vendors, the CAD tool people write the CAD tools say, oh, um, our CAD tool will only work on Red Hat Enterprise Linux three or something like that. We're only going to test it on that um, because it turns out that compiling software is really hard. And um, we don't want to test it anywhere else. So they don't really want to change any of this stuff. So what happens is, speaking of the Venn diagrams, the only Venn diagram uh, that, that all of these CAD tools match is on like one particular version of Linux, which uh, in this case was SUSE 10 or something like that, that went out of support four years ago. And I'm sure Intel's paying SUSE a lot to get patches for all of the security vulnerabilities in the kernel that old. But um, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Um.